The Eye of Discernment, 2. An Anthology from the Teachings of a John Lee Damadero. From Sudhidham Maransi Gamhiram Dhakaria. Selected and translated from the Thai by Thani Saro Pikhu. For free distribution only, as a gift of Dhamma. Contents Introduction From the Path to Peace and Freedom for the Mind. The Path to Peace and Freedom for the Mind. Virtue There are three levels of virtue. One het thimasila, normalcy of word and deed, which consists of three kinds of bodily acts. Not killing, not stealing, not engaging in sexual misconduct, and four kinds of speech. Not lying, not speaking divisively, not saying anything coarse or abusive, not speaking idly. If we class virtue on this level according to the wording of the precepts and the groups of people who observe them, there are four. The five precepts, the eight, the ten, and the two hundred and twenty-seven precepts. All of these deal with aspects of behavior that should be abandoned, termed pahanakika. At the same time, the Buddha directed us to develop good manners and proper conduct in the use of the four necessities of life. Food, clothing, shelter, and medicine so that our conduct in terms of thought, word, and deed will be orderly and becoming. This aspect is termed bhavanakika, behavior we should work at developing. Observance of these precepts or rules. Dealing merely with words and deeds. Forms the lower or preliminary level of virtue, which is what makes us into full-fledged human beings, manasa sampati. To mehihima sila, the medium level of virtue, i.e., keeping watch over your words and deeds so that they cause no harm. And, in addition, keeping watch over your thoughts so as to keep them upright in three ways. Aanabhijha visamalobha, not coveting things that do not belong to you and that lie beyond your scope or powers. Not focusing your thoughts on such things, not building what are called castles in the air. The Buddha taught us to tend to the wealth we already have so that it can grow on its own. The wealth we already have, if we use our intelligence and ingenuity, will draw more wealth our way without our having to waste time and energy by being covetous or greedy. For example, suppose we have a single banana tree, if we water it, give it fertilizer, loosen the soil around its roots, and guard it in other ways, our single banana tree will eventually give rise to an increase of other banana trees. In other words, if we're shrewd we can turn whatever wealth we have into a basis for a livelihood. But if we lack intelligence if our hearts simply want to get, without wanting work, then even if we acquire a great deal of wealth, we won't be able to support ourselves. Thus, greed of this sort, in which we focus our desires above and beyond our capacities, is classed as a wrong kind of mental action. Biyabiyapada, abandoning thoughts of ill will, hatred, and vengeance, and developing thoughts of benevolence and goodwill instead. Thinking of the good aspects of the people who have angered us. When people make us angry, it comes from the fact that our dealings with them, in which we associate with and assist one another sometimes lead to disappointment. This gives rise to dislike and irritation, which in turn cause us to brood. So that we develop hurt feelings that grow into anger and thoughts of retaliation. Thus we should regard such people from many angles, for ordinarily as human beings they should have some good to them. If they don't act well toward us, they may at least speak well to us. Or if they don't act or speak well to us, perhaps their thoughts may be well-meaning to at least some extent. Thus, when you find your thoughts heading in the direction of anger or dislike, you should sit down and think in two ways. 1. Try to think of whatever ways that person has been good to you. When these things come to mind, they'll give rise to feelings of affection, love, and goodwill. This is one way. 2. Anger is something worthless, like the scum that floats on the surface of a lake. If we're stupid, we won't get to drink the clean water that lies underneath. Or if we drink the scum, we may catch a disease. A person who is bad to you is like someone sunk in filth. If you're stupid enough to hate or be angry with such people, it's as if you wanted to go sit in the filth with them. Is that what you want? Think about this until any thoughts of ill will and anger disappear. See Samadithi, 
abandoning wrong views and mental darkness. If our minds lack the proper training and education, we may come to think that we and all other living beings are born simply as accidents of nature. That father and mother have no special meaning, that good and evil don't exist. Such views deviate from the truth. They can dissuade us from restraining the evil that lies within us and from searching for and fostering the good. To believe that there's no good or evil, that death is annihilation, is wrong view a product of faulty thinking and poor discernment, seeing things for what they aren't. So we should abandon such views and educate ourselves, searching for knowledge of the Dhamma and associating with people wiser than we. So that they can show us the proper path. We'll then be able to reform our views and make them right, which is one form of mental uprightness. Virtue on this level, when we can maintain it well, will qualify us to be heavenly beings. The qualities of heavenly beings, which grow out of human values, will turn us into human beings who are divine in our virtues. For to guard our thoughts, words and deeds means that we qualify for heaven in this lifetime. This is one aspect of the merit developed by a person who observes the middle level of virtue. 3. Uparimasila, Higher Virtue, where virtue merges with the Dhamma in the area of mental activity. There are two sides to higher virtue. A. Pahinakika, qualities to be abandoned, which are of five sorts. 1. Kamachanda, affection, desire, laxity, infatuation. 2. Biapada, ill will and hatred. 3. The Namita, discouragement, drowsiness, sloth. 4. Adakakukaksa, restlessness and anxiety. 5. Visakika, doubt, uncertainty, indecision. Discussion. 1. Ill will, Biapada, lies at the essence of killing, Panatipada. For it causes us to destroy our own goodness and that of others and when our mind can kill off our own goodness. What's to keep us from killing other people and animals as well? 2. Restlessness, Adaka, lies at the essence of taking what is not given, Adinadana. The mind wanders about, taking hold of other people's affairs, sometimes their good points, sometimes their bad. To fasten onto their good points isn't too serious, for it can give us at least some nourishment. As long as we're going to steal other people's business and make it our own, we might as well take their silver and gold. Their bad points, though, are like trash they've thrown away. Scraps and bones, with nothing of any substance. And yet even so we let the mind feed on them. When we know that other people are possessive of their bad points and guard them well. And yet we still take hold of these things to think about, it should be classed as a form of taking what isn't given. 3. Sensual Desires, Kamachanda lie at the essence of sensual misconduct. The mind feels an attraction for sensual objects thoughts of past or future sights, sounds, smells, tastes, or tactile sensations. Or for sensual defilements passion, aversion, or delusion to the point where we forget ourselves. Mental states such as these can be said to overstep the bounds of propriety in sensual matters. 4. Doubt, Visakika, lies at the essence of lying. In other words, our minds are unsure, with nothing reliable or true to them. We have no firm principles and so drift along under the influence of all kinds of thoughts and preoccupations. 5. Drowsiness, the Namita, is intoxication discouragement, dullness, forgetfulness, with no mindfulness or restraint watching over the mind. This is what it means to be drugged or drunk. All of these unwise qualities are things we should eliminate by training the heart along the lines of B. Bhavanakika, qualities to be developed. 1. Mindfulness, Sati start out by thinking of an object, such as your in and out breathing. Use mindfulness to steady the mind in its object. Vitaka, thinking in this way, is what kills off sensual desires. In that the discipline of mindfulness keeps the mind from slipping off into external objects. 2. Vikara, evaluate and be observant. Make yourself aware of whether or not you've received a sense of comfort and relaxation from your breathing. If not, tend to the breath and adjust it in a variety of ways. E.g., in long and out long, in long and out short, 
in short and out short, in short and out long, in slow and out slow. In fast and out fast, in gently and out gently, in strong and out strong, in throughout the body and out throughout the body. Adjust the breath until it gives good results to both body and mind, and you will be able to kill off feelings of ill will and hatred. 3. Pity, when you get good results. For instance, when the subtle breath sensations in the body merge and flow together, permeating the entire sense of the body. The breath is like an electric wire, the various parts of the body, such as the bones, are like electricity poles. Mindfulness and self-awareness are like a power source, and awareness is thus bright and radiant. Both body and mind feel full and satisfied. This is pity, or rapture, which can kill off feelings of drowsiness. 4. Sukha, now that feelings of restlessness and anxiety have disappeared, a sense of pleasure and ease for body and mind arises. This pleasure is what kills off restlessness. 5. Ikajita, doubts and uncertainty fade into the distance. The mind reaches oneness of object in a state of normalcy and equilibrium. This normalcy of mind, which is maintained through the power of the discipline of mindfulness, Satyavanaya, forms the essence of virtue. Firmness, steadiness, stability. And the resulting flavor or nourishment of virtue is tranquility, lightheartedness, and a sense of independence for the mind. When freedom of this sort arises within us, this is called the development of silanusity, the mindfulness of virtue. This is virtue that attains excellence leading to the paths, their fruitions, and nibbana and thus can be called uparimasila, higher virtue. To summarize, there are three levels of virtue, external virtue, intermediate virtue, and internal virtue. In ultimate terms, however, there are two. One mundane virtue, virtue connected with the world, in which we maintain the principles of ordinary human morality but are as yet unable to reach the transcendent levels. Stream entry, once returning, non returning, and era and ship. We can't yet cut the fetters, Sanayojana, that tie the heart to the influences of all the worlds. This is thus called mundane virtue. Two transcendent virtue, virtue that's constant and sure, going straight to the heart, bathing the heart with its nourishment. This arises from the practice of tranquility meditation and insight meditation. Tranquility meditation forms the cause and insight meditation the result. Discovering the true nature of the properties, aggregates, kandas, and senses, seeing clearly the Four Noble Truths. In proportion to our practice of the path, and abandoning the first three of the fetters. A Sakya Dithi, Self-Identity Views Views that see the body or the aggregates as part of the self or as belonging to the self. Ordinarily, we may be convinced that views of this sort are mistaken yet we can't really abandon them. But when we clearly see that they're wrong for sure, this is called right view. Seeing things as they truly are which can eliminate such wrong views as seeing the body as belonging to the self. Or the self as the five aggregates, or the five aggregates as part of the self. B. Visakika, doubt concerning what's genuine and true, and what's counterfeit and false. The power of right view enables us to see that the quality to which we awaken exists at all times. And that the true qualities that cause us to awaken also exist and are made effective through the power of the practices we're following. Our knowledge is definite and true. Our doubts concerning the virtues of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha are cleared up for good. This is called becoming an Iyadapugala, a person who is certain and sure. See Silabhata Paramasa, when the heart abandons this fetter it no longer dotes on theories concerning moral virtue. It's no longer stuck merely on the level of manners and actions. Good and evil are accomplished through the heart, activities and actions are something separate. Even though people who reach this level do good taking the precepts, making gifts and offerings, or meditating in line with the good customs of the world they're not caught up on any of these things. Because their hearts have reached the nourishment of virtue, they aren't stuck on the particulars, bianjana, i.e., their actions and activities. Nor are they stuck on the purpose, atha, i.e., the meaning or intent of their various good manners. Their hearts dwell in the nourishment of virtue, tranquility, stability, normalcy of mind.
just as a person who has felt the nourishment that comes from food permeating his body isn't stuck on either the food or its flavor. Because he's received the benefits of the nourishment it provides in the same way. The hearts of people who have reached the essence of virtue are no longer stuck on actions or manners, particulars, or purposes. Because they've tasted virtue's nourishment. This is thus classed as transcendent virtue, the first stage of Nibbana. Even though such people may be destined for further rebirth, they're apart from the ordinary. Anyone whose practice reaches this level can be counted as fortunate, as having received dependable wealth, like ingots of gold. Just as gold can be used as currency all over the world because it has special value for all human beings unlike paper currency. Whose use is limited to specific countries in the same way, a heart that's truly attained virtue has a value in this life that will remain constant in lives to come. Thus, a person who has reached this level has received part of the noble wealth of those who practice the religion. Concentration Concentration has three levels. 1. Kamavakarakanika Samadhi, momentary concentration in the sensory realm. The mind keeps thinking, coming to rest, and running along after worthwhile preoccupations. Either internal or external on the sensory level, sights, sounds, smells, flavors, tactile sensations, or ideas. An example of this is when the mind becomes quiet and rested for a moment as we sit listening to a sermon or chanting. In other words, the mind grows still for momentary periods in the same way that a person walks. One foot takes a step while the other foot rests on the ground, providing the energy needed to reach one's goal. This is thus called momentary concentration, something possessed by people all over the world. Whether or not we practice concentration, the mind is always behaving this way by its very nature. This is called the Bhavangasiddha or Bhavangapada the mind stops for a moment and then moves on. In developing higher levels of concentration, we have to start out with this ordinary level as our basis. Otherwise, the higher levels probably wouldn't be possible. Still, this level of concentration can't be used as a basis for discernment, which is why we have to go further in our practice. 2. Rupavakara Upakara Samadhi, Threshold Concentration in the Realm of Form this refers to the first yahana, in which the mind comes inward to rest on a single preoccupation within the body, fixing its attention. For example, on the in and out breath. When the mind stays with its one object, this is called a kajita. At the same time, there's mindfulness keeping the breath in mind. This is called vidhaka. The mind then adjusts and expands the various aspects of the breath throughout the entire body. Evaluating them mindfully with complete circumspection, this is called self-awareness, sampajana, or vikara, which is the factor aware of causes and results. Mindfulness, the cause, is what does the work. Thus vitaka and vikara cooperate in focusing on the same topic. We are then aware of the results as they arise feelings of fullness, pleasure and ease, pity and sukha, for body and mind. At this point, the mind lets down its burdens to rest for a while, like a person walking along who meets with something pleasing and attractive. And so stops to look, both feet are standing still, stepping neither forward nor back. If we aren't skilled enough to go on any further, we will then retreat. If we see results such as signs and visions arising in the mind, we may get excited and so cause our original preoccupation to waver or fade. Like a person sitting on a chair, if he sees something appealing in front of him. He may become so interested that he leans forward and reaches out his hand. He may even begin to budge a bit from his seat or stand up completely. In the same way, if we get engrossed in visions, thoughts, or views when we're engaged in threshold concentration, we can become excited and pleased we may even think that we've reached the transcendent and this can cause our concentration to degenerate. If we try to do it again and can't, we may then seize the opportunity to say that we've gone beyond the practice of concentration. So that we can now take the way of discernment thinking, pondering, and letting go in line with nothing more than our own views and ideas. This, though, is not likely to succeed, because our knowledge has no firm basis or core, like a wheel with no axle or hub, how can it get anywhere? 
The power of threshold concentration, if we don't watch after it well, is bound to deteriorate, and we'll be left with nothing but old, leftover concepts. 3. Rupavakara Apanasamadhi, Fixed Penetration in the Realm of Form This refers to the practice of all four levels of Rupa Yahana. The first Yahana has five factors, thinking, evaluating, fullness, pleasure, and singleness of object. The second level has three, fullness, pleasure, and singleness of object. The third has two, pleasure and singleness of object. And the fourth has two, equanimity and singleness of object. Discussion Fixed penetration in the realm of form means that the mind focuses on the internal sense of the body, remaining steadily with a single object. Such as the in and out breath until it reaches yahana, beginning with the first level, which is composed of thinking, evaluating, fullness, pleasure, and singleness of object. When you see results arising, focus in on those results and they will then turn into the second level, which has three factors. Fullness, pleasure, and singleness of object. As your focus becomes stronger, it causes the sense of fullness to waver, so you can now let go of that sense of fullness. And your concentration turns into the third yahana in which only two factors are left, pleasure and singleness of object. The mind has few burdens, its focus is strong and the sense of inner light is radiant. This causes the feeling of pleasure to waver, so that you can let go of that sense of pleasure. And the mind attains oneness in a very subtle preoccupation. The preoccupation doesn't waver and neither does the mind. It stands firm in its freedom. This is called equanimity and singleness of object which form the fourth yahana. Mindfulness is powerful. Self-awareness is complete. Both are centered on a single preoccupation without getting snagged on any other illusions or perceptions. This mental state is called the fourth yahana, which has two factors, equanimity, or stillness, is the external attitude of the mind. As for the real factors, their mindfulness and singleness, steady and firm. The mind experiences a sense of brightness, the radiance that comes from its state of fixed penetration. Mindfulness and self-awareness are circumspect and all-round, and so give rise to skill and proficiency in practicing yahana in focusing. Staying in place, stepping through the various levels, withdrawing, going back and forth. When the mind behaves as you want it to, no matter when you practice, only then does this truly qualify as fixed penetration. The basis for the arising of three qualities, intuitive knowledge, nana, discernment, panna, and cognitive skill, vija. Intuitive knowledge here refers to knowledge or sensitivity of an extraordinary sort. For example Pabhanivasanusiddhi nana, the ability to remember previous lives. Kutupapad nana, the ability to focus on the death and rebirth of other living beings. Sometimes in good destinations, sometimes in bad together with the causes that lead them to be reborn in such ways. This gives rise to a sense of weariness and disenchantment with sensations and mental acts, body and mind. Asavak Hayanana, knowing how to put an end to the defilements of the heart in accordance with the knowledge. The clear vision of the Four Noble Truths. That accompanies the particular transcendent path reached. And there are still other forms of extraordinary knowledge, such as Adhivadi, the ability to display supernormal powers. To make an image of oneself appear to other people, Dibesoda, Clairaudience, Dibakaku, Clairvoyance i.e. The ability to see objects at tremendous distances. Discernment refers to discriminating knowledge, clear comprehension, knowledge in line with the truth. For example Athapata Samhita, a cumin with regard to aims and results, thoroughgoing comprehension of cause and effect. Knowing, for example, how stress is caused by ignorance and craving. And how the disbanding of stress is caused by the intuitive discernment that forms the path. Comprehending the meaning and aims of the Buddha's various teachings and knowing how to explain them so that other people will understand being able. For instance, to summarize a long passage without distorting its meaning. Dhammapada Samhita, a cumin with regard to mental qualities. Knowing how to explain deep and subtle points so that other people will understand. Niradi Padasamhita, 
a cumin with regard to different languages. According to the texts, this includes knowing foreign languages and the languages of various other living beings by means of the eye of discernment, panakaku. Patiphanapata Samhita, a cumin with regard to expression. Being fluent in making explanations and quick-witted in debate, knowing the most strategic way to express things. All of these forms of discernment can arise from training the mind to attain fixed penetration. Vija clear, open knowledge, free from any further concealments, and a loka brilliance. Radiance streaming out in all directions enable us to see the true nature of sensations and mental acts. In accordance with our powers of intuitive discernment. Cognitive skill refers to clear, uncanny knowledge that arises from the minds being firmly fixed in yahana. There are eight sorts. 1. Vipassananana, clear comprehension of physical sensations and mental acts, rupa, nama. 2. Manomayati, psychic powers, influencing events through the power of thought. 3. Idhivati, the ability to display powers, making one's body appear in a variety of ways. 4. Dibhikaku, clairvoyance. 5. Dibhisoda, clairaudience. 6. Sataparayanana, the ability to know the mental states of other people. 7. Pabhanivasanusadinana, the ability to remember previous lives. 8. Asavakhayanana, the ability to put an end to the effluence that defile the heart. Thus, yahana on the level of fixed penetration is extremely important. It can give us support on all sides on the level of the world and of the Dhamma and can bring success in our various activities. Both in our worldly affairs and in our Dhamma duties, leading us on to the transcendent. To summarize, there are two kinds of concentration. One that which gives rise to mundane knowledge, this is termed mundane concentration. Two that which helps us to fulfill our duties on the level of the Dhamma, leading to Vipassananana or Asavakhayanana. The knowledge that enables us in accordance with the discernment and insight that arise to abandon or cut off completely the mental tendencies that lean in the direction of the fetters. This is termed transcendent concentration. Discernment Discernment is of three kinds. 1. Sutamayapana, discernment that comes from studying. 2. Sintamayapana, discernment that comes from reflecting. 3. Bhavanamayapana, discernment that comes from developing the mind. Discussion El Sudamayapana refers to the discernment that comes from having listened a great deal, like the Venerable Ananda. Listening here, though, includes studying and taking interest in a variety of ways. Paying attention, taking notes, asking questions, and taking part in discussions so as to become quick-witted and astute. Education of all kinds comes down to two sorts. A. Learning the basic units such as the letters of the alphabet, their sound, and pronunciation, so as to understand their accepted usage, and, b, learning how to put them together. For instance, how to combine the letters so as to give rise to words and meanings. As when we complete our elementary education so that we won't be at a loss when we're called on to read and write in the course of making a living. In the area of the religion, we have to study the letters of the Pali alphabet, their combinations, their meanings, and their pronunciation. If we don't understand clearly, we should take an interest in asking questions. If we have trouble memorizing, we should take an interest in jotting down notes as a way of aiding our memory and expanding our concepts. In addition, we have to study by means of our senses. For example, when we see a visual object, we should find out its truth. When we hear sounds or words, we should find out their truth. When we smell an aroma, we should consider it to see what it comes from. We should take an interest in flavors so that we know what they come from. And in tactile sensations the heat and cold that touch the body by studying such things as the way weather behaves. All of these forms of education are ways of giving rise to astuteness both in the area of the world and in the area of the Dhamma. Because they constitute a basic level of knowledge, like the primary education offered in schools. 2. Sintamayapana refers to thinking and evaluating so as to learn the meaning and truth of one's beginning education. This level of education draws out the meaning of the knowledge we have gained through studying. When we gain information, 
we should reflect on it until we understand it so that we will be led by our sense of reason and not by gullibility or ignorance. This is like a person who has used his knowledge of the alphabet to gain knowledge from books to complete his secondary education. Such a person has reached the level where he can think things through clearly. In the area of the Dhamma, the same holds true. Once we have learned the basics, we should research and think through the content of the teaching until we give rise to an understanding so that we can conduct ourselves correctly in line with the methods and aims taught by the sages of the past. This level of discernment is what prepares us to conduct ourselves properly in line with the true essence of the doctrine and discipline. This is classed as an aspect of Pariyati Dhamma, Dhamma on the level of theory. By learning the language and meaning of the teaching, we can become astute as far as theory is concerned. But if we don't use that knowledge to train ourselves, it's as if we studied a profession such as law. But then went out to become bandits, so that our knowledge wouldn't give its proper results. For this reason, we've been taught still another method, which is the wellspring of discernment or mastery i.e. The mental activity termed Bhavanamayapana. 3. Bhavanamayapana, discernment that arises exclusively from the practice of concentration. In other words, this level of discernment isn't related to the old observations we have gained from the past. Because our old observations are bound to obscure the new observations, endowed with the truth, that can arise only right at the mind. When you engage in this form of practice, focus exclusively on the present, taking note of a single thing, not getting involved with past or future. Steady the mind, bringing it into the present. Gather virtue, concentration, and discernment all into the present. Think of your meditation object and bring your powers of evaluation to bear on it say, by immersing mindfulness in the body, focusing on such objects as the in and out breath. When you do this, knowledge will arise. Nanamudapati, intuitive knowledge of things we have never before studied or known will appear. For example, Pubhanivasanusitinana the ability to remember our present life and past lives. Kutapapadanana the ability to know living beings as they die and are reborn well or poorly. Happily or miserably knowing the causes and results of how they fare, asavakhayanana. The ability to cleanse ourselves of the effluents that defile the mind, thinning them out or eliminating them altogether. As we are able. These three forms of knowledge don't arise for people who simply study or think things through in ordinary ways. They form a mental skill that arises from the practice of concentration and are an aspect of Dhamma on the level of practice, Patapati Dhamma. Another aspect Panahudapati, clear discernment of the true nature of the properties, Datu, aggregates and sense media arises. We can focus on these things by way of the mind and know them in terms of the Four Noble Truths, stress, Dukkha, which arises from a cause, Samudaya, i.e. Ignorance and craving, and then Ra, the ceasing and disbanding of stress, which occurs as the result of a cause, i.e. The path, Magga, composed of practices for the mind. These things can be known by means of the discernment that arises exclusively and directly within us, and is termed the Eye of Discernment or the Eye of Dhamma, the Eye of the Mind awakening from its slumbers. Vijahudapati, the eight forms of cognitive skill, which follow the laws of cause and effect means of practice that bring us results can arise in a quiet mind. Alakohudapati, brightness, clarity, relief and emptiness arise in such a mind. Thus, the discernment that results from developing the mind differs from the beginning stages of discernment that come from studying and reflecting. Study and reflection are classed as Dhamma on the level of theory, and can give only a preliminary level of knowledge. They're like a person who has awakened but has yet to open his eyes. The discernment that comes from developing the mind, though, is like waking up and seeing the truth past, present, and future in all four directions. We can clearly see stress, its cause, its disbanding, and the path to its disbanding, and so can abandon the first set of fetters. Our hearts will then flow to Nibbana, just as the water in a mountain cataract is sure to flow to the sea. Our hearts will flow to their natural truth, the mental fullness and completeness of a person who has practiced mental development until discernment arises within. 
we will meet with a special form of wisdom transcendent wisdom. Whose power will stay with us always, a quality that's certain and sure, termed certain truth, certain wisdom, making us people certain for Nibbana. So this level of discernment termed the discernment of liberating insight is especially important. It arises on its own, not from cogitating along the lines of old concepts we've learned, but from abandoning them. Old concepts are what obscure the new knowledge ready to arise. The nature of liberating insight is like an electric light, simply press the switch once, and things all around are made bright. In the same way, when the mind reaches a stage of readiness, insight will arise in a single mental instant, and everything will become clear. Properties, aggregates, and the sense media. We'll know, on the one hand, what's inconstant, anakam, stressful, duxum, and not self, anatta. And on the other hand, what's uncommon, i.e., nikam what's constant and true. Suksam true happiness, termed naramisa sukha, and atta the self. The eye of the mind can know both sides and let go both ways. It's attached neither to what's inconstant, stressful, and not self, nor to what's constant, nikam, good, suksam, and right, atta. It can let these things go, in line with their true nature. The knowledge that comes from discernment, cognitive skill and intuitive insight. It can let go as well. It isn't attached to views for there's yet another, separate sort of reality that has no this or that. In other words, it has no sense of I dot. It lets go of the assumptions that, that's the self, that's not the self, that's constant, that's inconstant, that arises, that doesn't arise. It can let go of these things completely. That's the Dhamma, and yet it doesn't hold on to the Dhamma, which is why we say that the Dhamma is not self. It also doesn't hold on to the view that says, not self. It lets go of views, causes, and effects, and isn't attached to anything at all dealing with wordings or meanings, conventions, or practices. This, then, is discernment that arises from the development of the mind. To conclude, the discernment that comes from studying and reflecting is classed as Dhamma on the level of theory. The discernment that comes from developing the mind is classed as Dhamma on the level of practice. The results that arise are two. One mundane discernment, comprehension of the world and the Dhamma falling under mundane influences and subject to change. Two transcendent discernment, awareness that goes beyond the ordinary, giving rise to clear realization within. People who reach this level are said to have awakened and opened their eyes, which is what is meant by Buddha. Dhamma talks. Insight isn't something that can be taught. It's something you have to give rise to within yourself. It's not something you simply memorize and talk about. If we were to teach it just so we could memorize it, I can guarantee that it wouldn't take five hours. But if you wanted to understand one word of it, three years might not even be enough. Memorizing gives rise simply to memories. Acting is what gives rise to the truth. This is why it takes effort and persistence for you to understand and master this skill on your own. When insight arises, you'll know what's what, where it's come from, and where it's going as when we see a lantern burning brightly. We know that, that's the flame. That's the smoke. That's the light. We know how these things arise from mixing what with what and where the flame goes when we put out the lantern. All of this is the skill of insight. Some people say that tranquility meditation and insight meditation are two separate things. But how can that be true? Tranquility meditation is stopping, insight meditation is thinking that leads to clear knowledge. When there's clear knowledge, the mind stops still and stays put. They're all part of the same thing. Knowing has to come from stopping. If you don't stop, how can you know? For instance, if you're sitting in a car or a boat that is traveling fast and you try to look at the people or things passing. By right next to you along the way, you can't see clearly who's who or what's what. But if you stop still in one place, you'll be able to see things clearly. Or even closer to home, when we speak, there has to be a pause between each phrase. If you tried to talk without any pauses at all, would anyone be able to understand what you said? 
This is why we first have to make the mind stop to be quiet and still. When the mind stays still in a state of normalcy, concentration arises and discernment follows. This is something you have to work at and do for yourself. Don't simply believe what others say. Get so that you know oh. Oh. Oh, from within, and not just oh. 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 From what people say. Don't take the good things they say and stick them in your heart. You have to make these things your own by getting them to arise from within you. Spending one dollar of your own money is better than spending one hundred dollars you've borrowed from someone else. If you use borrowed money, you have to worry because you are in debt. If you use your own money, there's nothing to worry about. Stopping is what gives rise to strength. If a man is walking or running, he can't put up a good fight with anyone, because the advantage lies with the person standing still, not with the person walking or running. This is why we're taught to make the mind stop still so that it can gain strength. Then it will be able to start walking again with strength and agility. It's true that we have two feet, but when we walk we have to step with one foot at a time. If you try to step with both feet at once, you won't get anywhere. Or if you try to walk with just one foot, you can't do that either. When the right foot stops, the left foot has to take a step. When the left foot stops, the right foot has to take a step. You have to stop with one foot and step with the other if you are going to walk with any strength because the strength comes from the foot that has stopped. Not from the foot taking a step. One side has to stop while the other side takes a step. Otherwise, you'll have no support and are sure to fall down. If you don't believe me, try stepping with both feet at once and see how far you get. In the same way, tranquility and insight have to go together. You first have to make the mind stop in tranquility and then take a step in your investigation. This is insight meditation. The understanding that arises is discernment. To let go of your attachment to that understanding is release. So stopping is the factor that gives rise to strength, knowledge. And discernment the fixed mind that knows both the world and the Dhamma in a state of heightened virtue. Heightened consciousness, and heightened discernment leading on to the transcendent. To get full results from our meditation, the mind has to give the orders. Mindfulness is what does the work and assists in the progress of all our activities. While alertness is what observes the results of what we've done. To speak in terms of the frames of reference, these qualities are called mindfulness and alertness. To speak in terms of yahana, they're called directed thought and evaluation. They're the qualities that give rise to discernment. Discernment comes from observing causes and effects. If we know effects without knowing causes, that doesn't qualify as discernment. If we know causes without knowing effects, that doesn't qualify, either. We have to know both of them together with our mindfulness and alertness. This is what qualifies as all-around knowing in the full sense of the term. The all-around knowing that arises within us comes from causes and effects, not from what we read in books, hear other people tell us, or conjecture on our own. Suppose we have some silver coins in our pocket. If all we know is that other people tell us it's money, we don't know its qualities. But if we experiment with it and put it in a smelter to see what it's made of and to see how it can be made into other things, that's when we'll know its true qualities. This is the kind of knowledge that comes from our own actions. This knowledge, when we meditate, comes in five forms. We find within ourselves that some things are caused by the properties of the body. Some are caused by the mind, some causes come from the mind but have an effect on the body. Some causes come from the body but have an effect on the mind, some causes come from the body and mind acting together. This kind of knowledge is discernment. So we have to learn from virtue, concentration, and discernment by giving rise to them. If we don't, we'll suffer from unawareness and delusion. Mindfulness is what brings light to the mind, like a candle. If we take a candle into a room at night, close the windows and doors. And fill in all the cracks in the walls, no wind from outside will be able to slip in and make the flame waver. The flame will give off even more light and we'll be able to see everything in the room clearly. 
Closing the windows and doors and filling in the cracks means exercising restraint over our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So that our attention doesn't go straying out after outside perceptions and preoccupations. This is called restraint through mindfulness. Our mindfulness will gather into one. When mindfulness is strong, the results are immediate. A sense of ease and mental well-being. When mindfulness is solid and unflagging, our concentration will become stronger. The mind will be still and upright. Light will arise in one of two ways, from within ourself or from what's reflected off the walls. This is why mindfulness is the cause, the supporting factor, that keeps our concentration progressing. What does discernment come from? You might compare it with learning to become a potter, a tailor, or a basket weaver. The teacher will start out by telling you how to make a pot, sew a shirt or a pair of pants, or weave different patterns. But the proportions and beauty of the object you make will have to depend on your own powers of observation. Suppose you weave a basket and then take a good look at its proportions, to see if it's too short or too tall. If it's too short, weave another one, a little taller and then take a good look at it to see if there's anything that still needs improving, to see if it's too thin or too fat. Then weave another one, better looking than the last. Keep this up until you have one that's as beautiful and well proportioned as possible, one with nothing to criticize from any angle. This last basket you can take as your standard. You can now set yourself up in business. What you've done is to learn from your own actions. As for your previous efforts, you needn't concern yourself with them any longer. Throw them out. This is a sense of discernment that arises of its own accord. An ingenuity and sense of judgment that come not from anything your teachers have taught you, but from observing and evaluating on your own the object that you yourself have made. The same holds true in practicing meditation. For discernment to arise, you have to be observant as you keep track of the breath and to gain a sense of how to adjust and improve it so that it's well proportioned throughout the body to the point where it flows evenly without faltering. So that it is comfortable in slow and out slow, in fast and out fast, long, short, heavy, or refined. Get so that both the in-breath and the out-breath are comfortable no matter what way you breathe. So that no matter when you immediately feel a sense of ease the moment you focus on the breath. When you can do this, physical results will appear a sense of ease and lightness, open and spacious. The body will be strong, the breath and blood will flow unobstructed and won't form an opening for disease to step in. The body will be healthy and awake. As for the mind, when mindfulness and alertness are the causes, a still mind is the result. When negligence is the cause, a mind distracted and restless is the result. So we must try to make the causes good in order to give rise to the good results we've referred to. If we use our powers of observation and evaluation in caring for the breath, and are constantly correcting and improving it, we'll develop awareness on our own, the fruit of having developed our concentration higher step by step. When the mind is focused with full circumspection, it can let go of concepts of the past. It sees the true nature of its old preoccupations, that there's nothing lasting or certain about them. As for the future lying ahead of us, it's like having to sail a small boat across the great wide sea. There are bound to be dangers on all sides. So the mind lets go of concepts of the future and comes into the present, seeing and knowing the present. The mind stands firm and doesn't sway. Unawareness falls away. Knowledge arises for an instant and then disappears, so that you can know that there in the present is a void. A void. You don't latch on to world fashionings of the past, world fashionings of the future, or dhamma fashionings of the present. Fashionings disappear. Avihya counterfeit, untrue awareness disappears. True disappears. All that remains is awareness, Buddha, Buddha. The factor that fashions the body, i.e., the breath, the factors that fashion speech, i.e., thoughts that formulate words and the factor that fashions the mind, i.e., thinking, all disappear. But awareness doesn't disappear. When the factor that fashions the body moves, you're aware of it. When the factor that fashions speech moves, you're aware of it. 
When the factor that fashions the mind moves, you're aware of it, but awareness isn't attached to anything it knows. In other words, no fashionings can affect it. There's simply awareness. At a thought, the mind appears, fashionings appear. If you want to use them, there they are. If not, they disappear on their own, by their very nature. Awareness is above everything else. This is release. Meditators have to reach this sort of awareness if they're to get good results. In training the mind, this is all there is. Complications are a lot of fuss and bother, and tend to bog down without ever getting to the real point.